what's going on everybody it's mr white here with another video lecture for you to teach you all about the european theater of world war ii uh, of course the european theater is not referring to a place where they were watching movies uh, we're talking about all of the fighting and battles that went on in and around europe during world war ii between 1939 and 1945 so get out a piece of paper you're going to need to take some notes uh, as you watch this video lecture you're going to want to record important information about people places and things because after this video lecture you are going to need to take a video quiz uh, the link to get to the video quiz is located in the information section uh, of this youtube page so if you kind of look down there somewhere I, I don't know you can probably see it down there yeah look down there click yeah the info thing that's what you need to click on okay so when you click down there on that little info thing uh, it's gonna have a, a web address that you can click on that's the link to the video quiz uh, take the video quiz it's 10 questions no big deal you can do this make sure you say who your history teacher is and this is gonna be for a daily grade okay so uh, you might be sitting there wondering why are we going through all this trouble to make a video lecture all about the European theater of World War II. Why do you need to know what happened in Europe in World War II? Uh, well, first of all, you got to understand that World War II is the largest war in history. It surpassed even the First World War in terms of the number of nations involved, uh, the amount of ordnance employed, meaning like the amount of stuff they blew up, uh, and the number of casualties, meaning the number of people who were killed or, or seriously wounded in the fighting. Um, during the five years of this bloody war, nearly 80 million people were killed. Um, just let that number soak in for a minute. 80 million people. Um, when we say 80 million, that includes about 30 to 50 million civilians. That means just normal people like you and me and 30 million soldiers. Um, just to put a number like 80 million in perspective, 80 million people is the combined population of the states of Texas, California, and New York. Not talking small states here. This is a lot of people. Um, secondly, it's important to know that World War II has shaped nearly every aspect of the world that you live in today, uh, economically, socially, and politically. Um, for example, just when you take a look at a world map like the one behind me here, uh, just about every single country on that map had its borders shaped by World War II. Um, not to mention the fact that the economic realities of our world, you know, the, the rich countries and the poor countries, uh, mostly became who they are based on the outcome of this war. Um, so really your whole life is shaped by World War II and, and that's why you need to know about it. Now, by the 1930s, Europe's major powers were still reeling from all the devastation caused by World War I. Um, most of the nations wanted to avoid war at any cost. Meanwhile, back over in the USA, uh, we were in a period of isolationism and we sort of passed up the opportunity to take a strong leadership role during this critical time in world history. Furthermore, the uh, global economic depression, remember the Great Depression, uh, meant that most nations were primarily focused on fixing economic rather than political problems. Um, all these conditions created a perfect storm, if you will, which spawned the Second World War. As you may remember from 1933 until 1939, the Allies tried to maintain peace in Europe through appeasing Hitler, remember? Um, Hitler often used hope and, and fear to sort of manipulate the Allies into doing what he wanted and also to buy time for his master plan. Um, each time Hitler asked for something, such as the return of German land that they lost during World War I, um, the Allies thought that giving in to his demands would ensure peace. But once they gave him what he wanted, Hitler almost always demanded more. After Germany successfully reacquired the Rhineland and Czechoslovakia and, and unified Germany with Austria, you know, all things that they weren't supposed to be doing based on the Treaty of Versailles, Hitler turned and set his sights on the country of Poland. Poland had been created from land that was originally part of Germany and Russia. As a result of the Treaty of Versailles, these areas were combined to create a whole new country for the Polish ethnic group. This land would be known as Poland. Many of the people who lived in this territory were ethnically German, not Polish. So Hitler argued that they should be reunited with the German nation. 
Furthermore, Poland has lots of fertile farmland and other natural resources that Germany wanted. The Allies did not agree to Hitler's annexation, so Hitler began preparing plans to invade and take Poland by force. To ensure that the Soviet Union did not challenge Germany's claims on Poland, Hitler signed a non-aggression pact with the dictator of the USSR, Joseph Stalin. This agreement stated that the Soviet Union and Germany would both invade and divide Poland among themselves. It also made both sides promise not to invade each other. Of course, Stalin would find out later that Hitler was not a man of his word. After the non-aggression pact was signed, Hitler moved swiftly to invade Poland. On September the 1st, 1939, the German Luftwaffe, or Air Force, began a heavy bombardment of Poland's capital city, Warsaw. Meanwhile, German tank divisions, motorized troop carriers, and infantry rapidly crossed the border into Polish territory. The invasion of Poland introduced the world to Germany's newest military strategy, the Blitzkrieg. Blitzkrieg means lightning warfare in German. The idea was to use the relatively new technology of air power in tanks to rapidly and mercilessly advance and seize enemy territory. These rapidly moving tanks and airplanes were followed closely by massive infantry forces, which quickly overwhelmed and subdued the bewildered defenders. In Poland, this strategy was more successful than anyone ever imagined. By the time that Britain and France declared war on Germany just two days later, the Polish government had already surrendered to the Nazis. As Hitler ravaged the western half of Poland, Stalin quickly occupied the eastern half along with the Baltic states of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. The Soviets also invaded Finland, but they would not give up without a fight. Finland was able to hold out against the brutal onslaught for several months, but the Soviet Red Army, with superior numbers, was able to crush the Finnish army through sheer force. Both sides suffered heavy losses. It would have been quite possible to have arranged a peaceful and honorable settlement between Germany and Poland, but Hitler would not have it. But a situation in which no word given by Germany's ruler could be trusted, and no people or country could feel itself safe, had become intolerable. Now may God bless you all, and may he defend the right, for it is evil things that we shall be fighting against. And against them, I am certain that the right will prevail. Meanwhile, as battles raged in Eastern Europe, the British and French began preparing to face the Germans along the old battle lines of World War I's Western Front. They stationed troops along France's northeastern border with Germany near a line of heavy fortifications known as the Maginot Line. The Allies built the Maginot Line in the aftermath of World War I to discourage the Germans from invading France as they did 20 years earlier. Allied armies sat and waited for the German Blitzkrieg to roll their way, but surprisingly, nothing happened. Instead, Hitler turned his armies north to invade Denmark and Norway. The Danish government surrendered to the Nazis in just about four hours. Two months later, Norway also surrendered. Hitler planned to use these nations as the staging area for an invasion of Britain. A month later, Hitler reversed direction and rapidly began to sweep through the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg as part of his strategy to conquer France. While the Allies were distracted by the fighting in these areas, Hitler sent an even larger force of tanks and infantry through the Ardennes Forest on the northeastern border between Germany, Belgium, and France. This allowed him to bypass the Maginot Line and rapidly advance towards France's capital, Paris. 
Using the highly successful Blitzkrieg tactics, the Nazis routed the unsuspecting Allied armies in France. Within a month, the German army entered Paris. The French government officially surrendered to the Nazis on June 22, 1940. The Nazis occupied the northern part of France and set up a puppet government in the south. The new state was known as Vichy France. They immediately made peace with Germany and joined the Axis powers. After France was defeated, Charles de Gaulle, a popular French general, set up a French government in exile. De Gaulle tried to organize the French resistance to the Nazi occupation from his headquarters in London. He committed all his energy to driving the Nazis out of France and re-establishing the French Republic. De Gaulle called on all the people of France to join him in this resistance. Many regular people fought and died on behalf of the resistance to the Nazi occupation in France. The occupation of France meant that by the end of 1940, nearly all of Western Europe was under Hitler's command. After the fall of France, Britain stood alone against the seemingly unstoppable Nazis. Britain's new Prime Minister, Sir Winston Churchill, declared that his nation would never surrender to Hitler. As Hitler turned his attention towards the invasion of Great Britain, Churchill began to prepare his people for the tough times ahead. Hitler planned to use the German Luftwaffe to obliterate Britain's defenses before sending an army of nearly 250,000 soldiers to occupy the island. In July of 1940, Hitler launched his attack on the British Isles. Germany's morning hate in this war takes the form of massed aerial attacks on the defenses of London. So this is now a familiar sight and a familiar sound. At first, the German Luftwaffe only targeted airfields, military bases, and factories in Britain. Eventually, however, the Nazis turned their attention to the major population centers, including London. The idea was to break the morale of the British. Hitler hoped that the heavy bombing would cause the British to lose hope and eventually surrender. Despite the widespread destruction and suffering caused by the German bombing campaign, the British managed to resist. Propaganda posters in London urged the British people to keep calm and carry on, despite the constant threat of German raids. New technology helped Britain to survive what became known as the Blitz. The invention of radar systems allowed the British to identify when German bombers were approaching. Citizens of London were on constant alert for loud air raid sirens that could be activated all over the city to warn people of the danger. Many Londoners found refuge in subway tunnels or basements, which served as makeshift air raid shelters during the war. This conflict became known as the Battle of Britain. The regular bombing raids continued until the summer of 1941, when Hitler decided to shift his attention to Eastern Europe in the Mediterranean region. The Nazis would go on to conquer most of North Africa and the Balkans using the highly effective Blitzkrieg strategy. Brilliant commanders like Irvin, the Desert Fox Rommel, crushed all resistance. With help from the Italians, the Germans dominated the Mediterranean in short order. Eventually, Hitler trusted his fellow dictator and ally, Benito Mussolini, to take over control of the war in North Africa. This proved to be a big mistake. The British counterattacked from their bases in Egypt and put the Italians on the defensive. Eventually, Rommel was sent to assist the Italians in their struggle to beat back the British resistance. The British continued to fight bravely against the Germans and Italians, but it was not until the United States entered the war in early 1942 that the Axis forces were driven out of North Africa for good. As the battle raged across the scorching sands of the Sahara Desert, Hitler began to prepare for his most daring campaign in the frigid steppes of Russia. The Soviet Union was completely unprepared when German tanks and airplanes began flooding across the border in June of 1941. The Red Army was large, but not well trained or equipped compared to their German counterparts. 
Stalin believed that Hitler would honor the non-aggression pact of 1939, but he had been deceived. Hitler had planned to invade the Soviet Union all along. The Nazis hated communists and saw the Slavic people as inferior to the German master race. Furthermore, like Poland, Western Russia has abundant farmland. Hitler believed that the Third Reich needed this land to allow for future population growth. The German army advanced at a relentless pace. Within a few weeks, the Nazis had advanced nearly 500 miles into the Soviet Union. Since they were not prepared to fight the Germans, the Red Army relied on a strategy that worked well for Russia in the Napoleonic Wars nearly 130 years earlier. Rather than fight the Germans, the Soviets retreated and burned their own towns and villages. The reason they did this was to trick the Germans into moving farther and farther away from their homeland and the supplies they needed. Burning their own towns meant that the Germans could not scavenge for any supplies as they advanced. As the Germans marched on for weeks and weeks, their supplies slowly began to run out. The Red Army, however, used this time to organize their forces and build up their strength. Eventually, as the harsh Russian winter began to set in, the Germans began to meet with resistance from the Red Army. Hitler was so confident of victory that he had not supplied his soldiers with proper winter equipment. As the temperatures began to fall, the lack of supplies and winter gear began to take a serious toll on the Germans. Eventually, some of his generals asked for permission to retreat back to Germany, but Hitler refused. He was determined to take Russia at all costs. The most devastating battle of this campaign came at a town called Stalingrad on the banks of the Volga River. Once again, the brutal Russian winter made life miserable for the German troops. Despite heavy losses, Joseph Stalin would not allow the Red Army to surrender the city that bore his name. This battle was one of the bloodiest on record. The city was 99% destroyed and nearly a million people lost their lives between August and February of 1942-43. Eventually, the Soviets defeated the Germans at Stalingrad. This marked a major turning point in the war. For the first time, the Germans had to go on the defensive. As a student of history, Hitler should have known better. The exact same problem was faced by Napoleon in 1812. Much like Napoleon, the disastrous campaign to conquer Russia would spell the beginning of the end for Hitler. While the Soviets battled against the Nazi invasion in the East, the British and Americans began to turn their attentions towards Southern Europe. Once the Axis powers were driven out of North Africa, Winston Churchill and President Roosevelt decided that the time was right to liberate Italy. Churchill called Italy Europe's soft underbelly because he realized that the Italians were not as formidable as the Germans. He reasoned that if the Allies could take out Mussolini and gain a foothold in continental Europe, the Axis defenses would begin to unravel. In July of 1943, the Allies invaded Sicily an island to the south of the Italian peninsula. And they used that as a base to work their way north across the Italian peninsula, town by town. After the fall of Sicily, Mussolini was toppled from power. He attempted to escape to Germany, disguised as a soldier, but he was captured and later executed by his own people. Italy joyfully welcomed the Allies and King Victor Emmanuel III replaced Mussolini as the leader of Italy. By May of 1944, the Allies began to prepare for a second invasion of Europe. This time, they planned to invade France in a final attempt to free them from Nazi rule. President Roosevelt chose General Dwight D. Eisenhower to command the Allied invasion of France. This invasion was known by the code name Operation Overlord. It was the largest land and sea attack in history. Eisenhower chose to strike the beaches of northwestern France in a place known as Normandy. At dawn on June 6, 1944, British, American, French, and Canadian troops stormed the beaches of Normandy. 
This assault became known as D-Day, which is a military term meaning the day of an important attack. The Germans were dug in and used machine guns, rocket launchers, cannons, and landmines in a desperate attempt to stop the Allies. Not surprisingly, the Allies took heavy casualties in this assault. Despite the losses, the Allies managed to capture and hold the beach. This allowed more troops and supplies to be brought in to aid the liberation of Europe. After two months of heavy fighting, the Allies marched into Paris and liberated France from Nazi occupation. Soon, the Allies also freed Belgium and Luxembourg. Now, they set their sights on Germany. One of the heroes of the march across Europe was General George Patton. He led the American Third Army to many victories against the Nazis. As the British and American armies advanced from the west, the Soviet Red Army was advancing from the east. Hitler found himself fighting an unwinnable war on two fronts. In a last ditch effort to push back the Allies, the Germans focused all their military strength on a counterattack. The Germans put all their military into the Ardennes forest region. German tanks broke through the American defenses along a 75 mile long front. This push into the Allied lines became known as the Battle of the Bulge. Eventually, the Americans were able to stop the German assault and force them to retreat. By March of 1945, the war was all but over in Europe. Hitler's armies were almost totally crushed. British, American, and Soviet troops raced to be the first to capture Germany's capital, Berlin. Throughout the world, throngs of people hailed the end of the war in Europe. It is five years and more since Hitler marched into Poland. Years full of suffering and death and sacrifice. Now the war against Germany is won. In the race to Berlin, the Soviets were the first to cross the finish line in April of 1945. As the Red Army lay siege to the crumbling city, Hitler took refuge in a secret underground bunker. Hitler was very afraid that the communists would take him prisoner and he swore that he would never let them take him alive. On April the 29th, Hitler married his longtime girlfriend, Eva Braun, in the bunker beneath the city. The next day, Hitler and Eva Braun, along with many of Hitler's closest and most trusted government officials and generals, took their own lives in the bunker. On May 7, 1945, General Eisenhower accepted the unconditional surrender of the Third Reich from the German military. When the document of surrender was signed on May 9, 1945, all of Europe celebrated. This became known as VE Day for Victory in Europe Day. And as a matter of fact, you might recognize this symbol. Everybody in Europe was running around throwing up this. To us, it means peace. But originally, this was the V for victory. So, after nearly six bloody years, the war in Europe was finally over. Well guys, uh, after a long time of video lecture, the video lecture is finally over. Yay! So, now what you need to do is go ahead and take that video quiz. Uh, the quiz link is down below in the information all about this video, so click on that link. Take the video quiz. It's only 10 questions. Come on, it's not that hard. Uh, it's for a daily grade. And remember that there's a limited time to do the quiz. So you gotta do the quiz before you come to class, okay? Now, uh, thanks for watching my video, guys. Uh, if you like my videos, please subscribe to my channel. Remember that I do test reviews, I do all kinds of video lectures, I even throw up travel videos every once in a while, so hey, you know, why not? Check it out, it's pretty cool. Anyways, uh, hope you guys liked the video, and uh, I'll see you next time.